Hey, I'm Jesse. Let's have a devotion. Cornelius has just downplayed the significance of what the angel said to him in this vision, and we admire his humility in that regard. He's invited Peter to come in and speak, and now Peter's going to speak up in verse 34 of Acts chapter 10. This is a pivotal chapter. Peter began to speak. Now I truly understand that God doesn't show favoritism, but in every nation, the person who fears him and does what is right is acceptable to him. He sent the message to the Israelites, proclaiming the good news of peace through Jesus Christ. He is Lord of all. You know the events that took place throughout all Judea, beginning from Galilee after the, uh, after the baptism that John preached, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power, and how he went about doing good and healing all who were under the tyranny of the devil because God was with him. We ourselves are witnesses of everything he did in both the Judean country and in Jerusalem, and yet they killed him by hanging him on a tree. Now he's likely evoking here a teaching from Numbers that said, cursed is anyone who is who is killed upon a tree, that it would defile the land. This is in fact uh, in a teaching of, in uh, Deuteronomy. The Pharisees wanted Jesus' body removed from the cross because they felt like it defiled the land. Like, t- like murdering Jesus didn't defile the land all the more. <laughs> this is Peter's message to this crowd of Gentiles. He is way out of his comfort zone because he was under this this previous impression that it was not even right for a Jewish man to be in the company of Gentiles. Jews used to wake up every day and thank God that they weren't Gentiles. And if they bumped into one on the street, they have to go home and get ceremonially clean all over again. And now here's Peter, having already been confronted by God in a vision that everything is now clean to eat. And, and he's way out of his comfort zone with his roommate, Simon the Tanner. And now he's way out of his comfort zone in Cornelius's house. But he can see that the Holy Spirit shows no favoritism. Okay, Peter began to speak. Now I truly understand that God doesn't show favoritism, but in every nation, the person who fears him and does what is right is acceptable to him. That is a huge deal. Jews don't speak that way about other nations. They really pride themselves on being God's elect. Do you have any friends who are, I know that strictly speaking, I might, classify as a Calvinist because I hold to the doctrine of election insofar as it pertains to the disciples and and the nation of Israel and to Paul, perhaps Timothy. Uh, But have you ever noticed this, that oftentimes within Calvinistic circles, there can be this, there can, there can be this sense of pride, which is really ironic because you should be, if you're a Calvinist, you should be the most humble person ever. Well, that sense of pride is quite logical when viewed through the proper context of election, that they they apply that corporate sense of election that God gave to Israel, the descendants of Jacob, to all Christians today. And likewise, the people of Israel really pride themselves on being God's chosen nation, God's chosen people, to the neglect very frequently of the larger multinational scope of the covenant that God first made with Abraham. It wasn't just for their own sake. It wasn't just for their own political interest that Jesus came. Right after the cross, at the beginning of the book of Acts, in chapter, I believe, uh, chapter one, I believe, verse seven, they are, verse six, they wouldn't, okay, are you going to restore the kingdom to Jerusalem now? Are you going to oust the Roman occupiers and give us back our political influence? It's the classic metaphysical error of Jews to think that it's all about, it's all about the political interests of Israel alone. And God does care about the political interests of Israel. He does have prophecies that are fulfilled in a Zionistic sense. He does do that. I believe that Ezekiel 37 prophesied the rebirth of Israel in May 14th, 1948. But from the very beginning, it's been about blessing all nations, all nations, all nations. This is a light bulb moment for Peter when he's surrounded by Gentiles at Cornelius' house. Now I truly understand that God doesn't show favoritism, but in every nation, the person who fears him and who does what is right is acceptable to him. And he goes on to basically give a summary of what I think is the book of Romans. He sent this message to the Israelites proclaiming the good news of peace through Jesus Christ. He is Lord of all. We're going to talk more about that 
this weekend in our sermon as, as Peter is going to uh, do part of the preaching for us this weekend. And you're going to watch what happens by the power of the Holy Spirit. And we're going to have a theological discussion about the gift of tongues and how it pertains to the early church and what we do with this gift today. Is it a legitimate gift? Is it real? Is everybody just faking it? Does it still apply? What about these other teachings about when the perfect comes in the end of the apostolic age? What do you make of all this? I'm going to do the best that I can to try to explain from a biblical perspective, using 1 Corinthians 13 as a cross-reference, what happens here and what this has to do with us and how it affects us today. God showed Peter not to show favoritism. Would you search your own heart? We're praying for revival in one of the most diverse cities in the world. Would you search your own heart for favoritism and ask God to work in your heart exactly what he worked in Peter's heart here? It was a really big deal for Peter to overcome his sense of elitism as a son of the chosen nation of God. Would you let that same Holy Spirit do that same ministry in your heart? Because we're praying for revival, and it may not look quite the way you think. Let's live out the book of Acts together today.